If I look six to eight months from today, I see the potential for upside uh, surprises to be tremendous, meaning the economy could be performing much, much better come August, September than we even imagine right now. Hello, agentpreneurs, and welcome back to the Daily List Report. As you saw, we have back on the show one of my absolute favorite guests, George Wright, to senior economist at Realtor.com. He's been a regular on the show. It's been a couple months, but he's back to share all of the latest economic updates. We're going to talk about the market, the stimulus, the GDP, all of these things that if you don't understand, don't be scared of them. He puts them in a way that we can all understand and relate to them. And I definitely want you to understand these things because these are the underpinnings of our economy. A couple things before we get started. One, we're doing something new here. I am moving some of this content, short little snippets and bits to Instagram uh, so that during the course of your busy day, you're gonna be able to stay up to date on all of the great content like what George is sharing. So definitely check us out there. It's just Randy Shiozaki. I've told you guys, make your Instagram easy to find. So it's just my name. Go ahead and give us a follow there. And of course, while we're here, let's talk about a couple things. First one is realtor.com slash research. So you can learn all about George's group and what they're doing there. In fact, they publish a ton of data, monthly market summaries. And if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, there's a place to put your email address in and you can get a lot of this stuff by email. So definitely check them out there. And of course, give them a follow as well on Instagram at realtor.com. Again, all these links are below, so definitely check it out. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna bring George on the show. George, welcome back. Thank you, Randy. Happy New Year, and uh, it's really good to, uh, to get back with you and, uh, of course, all the agents that are tuning in. Thank you, thank you. Um, I love that you do this. You know, we always have a good time. We always have a great chat, George. You know, this is really fun. And, you know, this is an opportunity, as I think we, we both have talked about and would agree, that sometimes these topics can seem a little bit heady. They can seem a little bit academic. They can seem a little bit intimidating, right? And yet, it's so important that we understand these things, right? Because these are the major drivers of what we see every day in the market, aren't they? Oh, you're absolutely right. In fact, to me, that's the real attraction of when you look at the economy, when you look at business, it's really you, me, and all of us really collectively making decisions every day, right? We make decisions with our money. We make decisions with our time. All these decisions really uh, sum up to a big picture. And so really taking a look at this picture is looking at ourselves in the mirror and, and really paying attention to the trends sometimes help us make much, um, much more informed and better decisions. Yeah, absolutely, George. So, you know, it's January. We're, we're getting into the end of January here. You know, that's a good time to do a quick retrospective on 2020. You know, we talked a lot in 2020, George, right? And, you know, we talked about forbearance and we talked about unemployment and those numbers were spiking and then they were dropping. And, and yet, from a real estate perspective, Man, prices are crazy high. Inventory is super low. Rates are still super low. And it's this, there's a weird disconnect cognitively, like rationally, right? You're like, how could so many people be out of work and yet real estate is so strong? So why don't we just talk a little bit? Why don't we kick it off here and kind of recap 2020? What did we see? Absolutely. So let's let's talk about the fact that 2020 was really a unique year. And I'll call it that way. Even even going back 100 years, right? We looked at the COVID pandemic on through the lens of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Um, and yet, even so, I think we're, 2020 was by far a unique year. Obviously, COVID impacted and marked the year indelibly. Um, and But to your point, it really had an interesting impact on the economy, on employment, on housing. And you're right, <clears throat> we saw April of last year wipe out a decade's worth of job gains in one month, right? Over 20 million jobs dropped in one month. We saw some of those being recovered over the May to, to uh, November period, but December saw the loss of about 140,000 and we're still about 10 million jobs below where we were prior to the pandemic. So that gives you a sense of how severe the economic impact from this uh, pandemic has been. 
On the other hand, you're absolutely right. You pointed out that housing and, and real estate markets, um, in a sense, saw an incredible resurgence. They took a hit, if you remember, March, April, May, but then come June, absolutely. July, and then tail end of, of fall, and, and even into winter, we saw demand extremely strong. So what really drove that? Really, uh, there were, I would say, three factors. Let me start first and foremost with the fact that as the pandemic hit, we were in the longest expansion in economic history for the US. And why is that important? Wages were increasing, people's uh, real estate uh, and stock portfolios were increasing, and just as importantly for homeowners, their homeowners equity due to price growth had reached new records. This put the country in a very different position than when we were, let's say, the last recession, right? Where we were over leveraged and ended up ended up being um, underemployed. Yeah. So that right there was a solid foundation to go into this for housing. On top of that, the second factor that I think contributed to this um, undeniably was the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. So the Fed not only resorted to 0% rates and ended up unleashing an alphabet soup of lending facilities, but it became a major purchaser of mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. so it complemented whatever the private market was doing in a big way, ensuring that mortgage rates stay low. And the low did they stay? They broke record lows, right, for I think 15 times before the end of the year. Um, ended up, you know, uh, I think about 2.62, if I'm not wrong, at the, the lowest uh, for the Freddie Mac 30 year fixed. Yeah. Um, unbelievably low, right? So with these low rates, a lot of people had jobs, one, two especially those who are able to work remotely um, uh, were, were actually able to qualify for a mortgage. So the third aspect um, of, of this housing rebound, I think, was driven by what I call the coming of age of remote work, right? So it's something that, as we chatted before, it was promised in the mid-90s by the uh, you know, emergence of the Internet. Hey, one day you'll be able to work from practically anywhere. And, well, we were know, also promised paperless, George, if you recall. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. There lots of promises at that time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, some promises take longer than others, right? Indeed. Anyway, here we are, rough, roughly, you know, 20 some years since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year, by necessity, remote work proved itself not only viable, but really successful. Mm -hmm. Company um, really uh, measured increased productivity. It turns out that simply by not commuting, uh, we saved millions of hours collectively across the country. Yeah. And what did we choose to do with those millions of hours of extra time? You figure, you know, we'd watch Netflix. No, we actually worked more, right? It's so crazy, I don't know, isn't it? Yes. Us. Maybe we need some, you know, some, <laughs> some sources of imagination of what to do. But the point is remote work proved itself successful. And so when you think about uh, a strong financial foundation, Number two, strong monetary policy and low rates, and three, remote work. What we have here is a recipe for strong demand for housing. Why yeah. most of us who could started looking for a house that suited this lifestyle. We discovered that the houses we bought prior to the pandemic were no longer big enough, no longer close to the outdoors enough, especially if you lived in Manhattan or the Bay mm -hmm. Area. So we started buying homes for this new environment. So in essence, that's where I see the, the success story for housing in 2020. Um, and of course, we had a few more nuances, right? We had inventory that began to evaporate due to the yeah. strong housing demand. We started 2020 underbuilt by our own calculations, about 3.8 million homes short over the past decade. Just looking at household formation and population growth versus new construction. Some estimates go as high as 5.7 million homes short. Either way, it, it, it's, a, it's a situation in which when you have strong demand, not enough, um, you know, construction and new and homes available, you're going to see double digit price growth. Why is that, though, George? That's see, that shocks me. Right. So what you're saying is that, you know, just based on population growth, we were millions of homes short of what we needed. And yet. Why is that the case, right? Like the builders are all over these kinds of things. How, how did that happen? Excellent question, Randy. And when you look, and you'd have to look back to the last recession for the seeds of where we are today. Hmm. Think about it. last recession was had a tremendous negative impact on obviously the, the real estate market, but specifically on the construction 
industry why we found ourselves if you remember uh, during the the housing bust with an oversupply in many markets the overhang was the order of tens of thousands of homes and so what happened a lot of construction companies particularly small local and and even smaller regional ones went out of business and they never came back so the construction landscape has been really dominated by the large publicly traded companies think here Pulte, Lennart, Paul Brothers and so on mm -hmm. as well as some of the regional builders uh, the the um, good news is they've been very active recently and especially over the last three years they really upped their uh, pace however when you go back 10 years and look at 2000 roughly 10 to 2017 what you see is a construction landscape where builders were focused mostly on higher margin products they were looking at luxury uh, homes they were looking at premium homes the premium uh, retirement community type homes had obviously a little more leeway in being mm -hmm. disciplined about their approach they didn't have to overbuild and so as a result, the volume of construction really took a step back uh, to, to profitability. All normal, as you'd expect in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a typical market. The trouble is that over this period, we've had continued population growth. We've had the coming of age of the largest um, demographic cohort in the history of the US. Think about the millennials, right? So just the last year, this year, and in the next two years, every single one of these years we're going to have about 4.7 million millennials turn 30 every year that's a yeah. tremendous demographic tailwind it's fantastic the trouble is think back at the last time in our history and when we had this kind of demographic swell was during the baby boomer time 19 mm -hmm. roughly 5 through 1960s 65 think back at that time and even if you know i wasn't alive then but looking at history and history books and, and documents what we can we know is then the, the type of new homes that were available were across the price range everything from the steers home that could be shipped to your house and you put it up all the way to affordable housing all the way to custom and luxury products right so there was a new home available for every pocketbook this time around with this with an even bigger demographic upswell we are in a different position most of the new product on the market is towards the upper end so not surprisingly we have, and we saw this in, in the latest existing home sales from NAR, we are at 1.9 months supply. So if all right. the houses in America got to be sold, we would exhaust that in, in less than two months. Our own data at Realtor.com, when we look at active inventory, we are also at record lows, uh, homes you know, for sale listed. So uh, in a nutshell, you know, that's sort of the story of how we got here. Wow. George, you are an encyclopedia of knowledge. I'm not even kidding. It's amazing. It doesn't matter what I ask you. Uh, you always have an answer, uh, and it's steeped with history, and it's incredible. So, sorry, I just had to go all fanboy on you for a minute there. I appreciate you and all of this knowledge that you share. Um, George, that's a great recap of 2020. So, let's now sort of use our crystal ball, right? So, now we're looking at 2021. Um, and... Nothing fundamentally from, you know, the average Joe on the street, the average agent listening has changed, right? There's still no inventory, rates are still low, um, you know, they're still trying to figure out, you know, what to do. Um, what are the underpinnings of what's happening now, right? So let's talk about maybe mortgage applications, maybe we talk a little bit about um, the stimulus that's coming up. Maybe we talk a little bit about forbearance or foreclosure moratoriums, right? There's a handful of things I think at play. Um, and the GDP, the Q4 GDP numbers that are going to be coming out, right? So there's a handful of sort of, I think, things at play here, which will portend at least the near future. I would love to get your take on those things. Sure. So let's start with, with the market. And what I see in the market really is a uh, unseasonably strong um, demand uh, in the market. So to your point, right, we are in January and uh, consumer demand for homes remains solid and we see that in uh, in our weekly update so the the latest week we we saw active inventory drop by over 40 percent that's tremendous considering that we've had roughly five almost six months of double digit declines in act in, in active listings in addition on a yearly basis prices median prices for co for homes on the market were up 15 percent actually i think we're up a little over 15 15 percent 
0.3 percent. Yeah. Again, tremendous. It's it's reaching new new heights. So what this tells me is that uh, demand and, and appetite for for housing remains solid. So for agents out there, I know that there are a lot of headwinds in in various ways, and we can touch upon that. But it signals to me that the, the real estate market remains one in which consumers are active. And when you think about specifically millennials, and we, we chatted about this before, mm -hmm. this was the generation that by any account was going to ruin the country, right? That's they weren't right. going to own any home. They were not going to yep. buy cars. They were not going to buy anything. They're going to yep. rent everything for their whole life and ride a bicycle everywhere, right? That's right. Get DoorDash <laughs> for dinner every night, right? That's what it was going to be. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, it turns out that the millennials are very much the dominant force in the market. And contrary to these expectations or myths we've heard for about 15 years, it turns out that stage of life is very much driving this, uh, this preference shift, meaning the oldest millennials are turning 40 this year, right? Decidedly approaching middle age. Yeah. They have families, they have children. So their interests are all of a sudden very different. They mm -hmm. care about schools, they care about quality of life. And so what we're seeing is a, is a complete shift away from the high density urban environment towards more suburban living. And so why is this relevant? Because with, as I mentioned earlier, with the strong and high number of millennials turning 30 over the next few years, we're in an incredible sweet spot for housing demand and real estate, which I think is, is tremendous good news. Um, and so the main challenges, however, you know, January 2021 that we're facing are decidedly uh, not enough homes. And, and it, it's hard to underscore it. Um, again, the, the builders have really pushed. We saw December numbers about construction. You saw mm -hmm. that uh, single family, specifically building, really took a leap. It was up double digits compared to a year ago. Mm -hmm. And they were already ramping up then. But it's simply not enough to, to keep up, at least right now in this moment. Now, I expect this to improve over the year as we go through the next two to three quarters, you know, well into the spring, summer and early fall. As long as builders keep the pace, I do see that picture improving. Um, but George, obviously for now, let me ask you a question there. Sorry, George, let me just interject yeah. one thing on that. You know, if I if I think back, as, as you've pointed out many times, right, sort of just the underpinnings of the market, the what was the number you quoted me before? What percentage of Americans own their home outright, roughly? About uh, four out of 10, 36%. So I run it up four out of 10 Americans. Okay, very precise. That's amazing. Um, so we have tons of equity here, right? Hopefully we've learned some lessons from 2008. Is there, do you see any risk that we're in a scenario where we're going to end up just overbuilding? There's going to be a glut of homes and that could have some kind of negative impact on the market? Or are they clearly still building behind the curve given our shortage here? Excellent question, Randy. And my view here is we're very much still behind the curve, um, at least for 2021 and even 2022. I do not see really the danger of overbuilding, in part because whether it's it's for sale and I, I even take a more holistic picture and look at the for rent market. Right. You look at multifamily construction, even there, the, the, the you might have pockets, especially right now in places like New York, San Francisco, where we're seeing rents really soften because of this migration away from from downtowns but overall there's not to me a danger of overbuilding anywhere near the extent to where we had in 2008 mm -hmm. so for the for sale market um i don't see the the affordability challenges which is where we are right now in a serious affordability challenge yeah. i don't see that necessarily swapping and becoming a, a over, you know, building a glut of homes, which would lead to a sudden drop in prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, I derailed you there a bit. You were going on to some of the other things that are coming out here soon. Oh, no, absolutely not a, not a problem. All I was going to do is point out that all of these factors have now pushed affordability really as a front and center issue mm -hmm. uh, for 2021, you know, in housing markets uh, across the country. And I say this because while we many times talk about uh, New York, Chicago, DC, Boston, San Francisco, Los Angeles, it's important to know that some of the most uh, popular and in demand markets are those which have up to, to 2020 been fairly affordable. Think here in Nashville, think here in Jacksonville, um, think here 
uh, Columbia, uh, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, parts of North Carolina, Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham. Um, these markets are now really going through the same exact difficulty with affordability, particularly for long-time residents, right? We've seen this, this outflow of folks from um, high-cost areas into these affordable markets over the last two years. Uh, this move got accelerated during the pandemic. And so for a lot of residents that have, you know, been in these markets long, a long time, uh, for them, the, the affordability is even steeper, right? Because they've been used to seeing market go up at a reasonable pace year after year. The incomes in those markets moved up linearly. And all of a sudden, with home values jumping due to this demand from both internal and external to the market, they are obviously facing similar challenges. Absolutely. So, do, yeah, the only thing I'll, I'll simply add to this is I think that the, the, the financing environment will remain the silver lining to these, these challenging clouds that we're seeing on the horizon um, in the sense that I expect rates to remain favorable. We do see them rise, particularly in the second half of this year. Uh, first half, I think they'll remain uh, fairly low. We're beginning to see now some upticks and we'll probably see more volatility week to week. But overall, we expect them to average about 3.2% in 2021, so this year, a little bit above last year's. You know, George, no, that's, that's good. Thank you for that. I'm wondering what your thoughts are, right? Obviously, we have a new administration, and we might expect that this administration would be more active in um, sort of allowing more people to realize the dream of home ownership, right? And I think there's been some talks about some credits and things like that. Um, any thoughts on what you think that's going to be or what that might be or any signals that have already been sort of sent um, around along those lines? So an excellent and timely question, Randy. And here what we know is that the Biden administration has had as part of its uh, campaign platform very much uh, affordable housing and, and affordable home ownership as a centerpiece of its agenda. And we saw some of the details, right? We saw the $15,000 credit for first-time home buyers. We're seeing the push to alleviate the construction pipeline and the rising costs mm -hmm. in some ways from the federal government, working with municipalities and, and states in trying to find ways to streamline some of the zoning. So I think all of these are, are important and very much needed components of a sustainable long-term strategy. So I think we're going to see some moves. The, the big question here, um, really depends on a number of factors. Let me start with one. In terms of zoning and real estate development, most of the controls are at the local level. And so here, obviously, municipalities uh, are just as, as interested and should be just as interested in taking a hard look at this, at this problem. We've had a large number of, of towns and cities across the country, especially over the last decade, who have had a strong growth in population, um, boosting the local economy, but many of their zoning regulations haven't really squared off against that growth. Namely, a lot of them still uh, seem to be rooted in a different uh, demographic environment and different economic times, think, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And so I think for a lot of municipalities, this is something that's important to take a, a harder look at. And we saw that, you know, with, with some, some places where, where they increased, for example, zoning density, a, a welcome sign, Others which are struggling with that, and you see the, the prices reflect that. Now, on the federal level, I would say that the ability to provide some sort of an incentive. To me, I, I prefer in market incentives, much more so to an outright regulation, which many times has a, a host of unintended consequences. Providing financial incentives to first-time buyers, I think, would go a ways towards alleviating the financing and affordability challenge. So I, I welcome those. Uh, when you say incentive, George, like just for everybody watching, it's kind of similar to the incentives given and still being given for electric cars as an example, right? Absolutely. That's a great, uh, that's a great analogy, right? The electric cars still receive um, incentives. In other words, if you buy a, an electric vehicle, you, you get a, a certain, uh, you know, I think it's 7,500 if I mm -hmm. does last roughly um, as, as a credit. Uh, which, in a sense, practically lowers the price of that vehicle, right? So similarly for housing, by offering a credit of some sort, uh, you would effectively lower the cost of housing for, for first-time buyers, um, which, in a sense, is, would be great news. 
Now, given the current environment, of course, the concern with that is that it's going to juice the market, even stronger demand without, uh, you know, commensurate supply. Supply, so exactly. Up, that's, that's the tricky tightrope uh, that, that you will be walking. Um, and of course, in, in the broader scheme, I also take a realistic approach and, and the way Washington and, and the Congress works. And, and think about all the challenges and priorities the current administration is working to tackle, right? Everything from the vaccine distribution to a whole host of other regulatory and legislative priorities. So I think that the housing one is right at the top of the agenda. It remains to be seen in what form, in what shape and timing wise when it's going to, uh, to pass. Yeah, absolutely. So George, why don't we, as we wrap up, you know, we've talked about some of the things that I think we understand about 2021, there's some things that we don't understand necessarily yet. So, and maybe these are some of the the, the sad or the, the the worst things, right? I do want to talk just for a moment, get your take on on where you think unemployment is going. Um, obviously, the vaccine is rolling out. California, where I live, the mandatory stay-at-home orders were just lifted yesterday, I believe. Doesn't mean that some counties still aren't on really tight lockdown. It just means that you don't have to, everybody doesn't have to stay at home or isn't supposed to stay at home. So there's a lot of things happening here, and then forbearance and moratorium on evictions. So is there is there a lot of pent up sort of pending evictions? I don't know where forbearance stands right now, but maybe a quick update on some of these sort of sadder sides of what's happening in the market. Sure. So let's start with with the fact that uh, I think. Um, for 2021, the rolling out of the vaccine is the, the key component of a successful transition towards some sort of a, a normal. Um, and so from what I'm seeing right now, yes, it's, it's slow, but it seems to be steady. Um, the success rate seems to be quite high. So I think in, in, on balance, if I look six to eight months from today, I see the potential for upside uh, surprises to be tremendous meaning the economy could be performing much, much better come August, September than we even imagine right now. So I'll start with that. Of course, there's always, you know, downside risk to, to any scenario. Um, number two, on the forbearance issues, we've watched forbearance close 2020 at about five, five and a quarter percent. Um, so actually lower than I would have forecasted back in April of last year. Um, that being said, we saw the, the latest week, we saw a slight uptick in, in forbearance, also the, the loans that are in late stages of delinquency also rising. Um, the truth is we have until the end of March uh, for this to work itself out. So given the performance so far, I expect this to not be nearly the issue out of, I would have told you, you know, a, a year ago. When and you so, say, George, sorry, just let me interject though. When you yeah. say until March to work itself out, you know, these are some of the, the, the guidance that was given last year, right? Some of these, some of this expires then. But when you say work itself out, I mean, historically, we were what, sub 1% is healthy or at least modeled for. So what does that mean, work itself out? Does that mean we have to go from five and a quarter to 1% or somewhere in between? Excellent question. So right now at a five and a quarter, roughly, we're looking at 2.7 million um, loans that are in forbearance. So there's a hard number for you. Yeah. So basically getting down to somewhere around 1 million loans in forbearance, mm -hmm. to me, would be a huge improvement. And, and really, that's largely dependent, of course, on the performance of the, the labor market. And as you said, um, roughly the end of March is the period at which the second 180-day forbearance period provided mm -hmm. by the CARES Act last year ends, mm -hmm. right? So during this period, homeowners can ask their lenders to, to defer their payments and, and work out a repayment plan. So come April, we'll have a much better understanding of what the situation is. But like I said, we've had roughly nine months uh, to see how homeowners are faring during this period. And the fact that we're at, at five, five and a quarter percent, to me, is not as, as dramatic as I really feared early on. Um, is this a rosy picture? No, no, I, I'm not claiming that. Sure. But I say the potential, especially as... Uh, un as unemployment will hopefully uh, decline as, as vaccines roll out, as our social activity and business activity begins to emerge from this frost, I do see that as a potential uh, tailwind for housing. So 
that, that's where I stand on, on the forbearance. And, and I look at the latest employment. So look at December. We lost on balance 140,000 jobs during the month. But when you look specifically by sectors, most of that was concentrated in the restaurant uh, and lodging. And in sure. fact, government, specifically state and local governments, where there's a lot of pressure right now from lost revenue. But when you look at all the other sectors of the economy, they actually had gains in employment. Hmm. For me, the really strong uh, positive signal, it tells me that manufacturing, uh, business and professional services, healthcare, they're all still expanding because they're still rehiring people, right? So in that regard, I'm a little uh, more bullish on, on the forbearance picture than I would have been even three months ago. George, you know, I think we talked about this before, right? But it is the case, sadly, that it sounds like most of the jobs that have been lost have been at the lower wage levels and that these may have been predominantly renters as opposed to home buyers, right? So is that what the data is showing that, you know, the, that the growth that you speak of in jobs, right? Um, or most of the loss, I guess, conversely, right, is in sort of these lower wage positions. Absolutely, absolutely. When you look at really what took the brunt, think of about the restaurant and, and generally hospitality industries, think of airline, um, in, you know, and travel, generally speaking, uh, industry as well. And think of, you know, concert, uh, conference venues, theaters. Absolutely, it, it, these are not necessarily the top of the pay scale. Right. So you're absolutely right. This is where uh, bringing the discussion now to the the the. the, the, the eviction moratorium that's mm -hmm. been put in place. And we saw a couple of measures, one that expired at the end of August and then the CDC measure, they got put in place uh, beginning of September, which uh, it was scheduled to expire at the end of December and they got extended. Um, that's where those came in place. The trouble with the, with the September, the CDC uh, moratorium was that it didn't really address the underlying problem. Number one, tenants can't afford to pay and that, that came just as the ex, you know, enhanced unemployment benefits expired. Two, uh, landlords at the same time without the revenue from the rents couldn't service their own uh, loans with their lenders. And I think for, for many people, the assumption is, well, you know, we're talking here about deep pocketed landlords, major corporations. The truth is about three quarters of landlords in America are small, either individual groups of investors who have pulled funds and are in essence providing affordable housing. So these are not people with deep pockets, right? right? So the pressure is beginning to show. In fact, it's beginning to show across the entire spectrum. Even large deep pocketed landlords are now beginning to show uh, significant defaults on their payments. We saw some data coming from, from industry sources that the default rate, even for uh, large well-capitalized loans is beginning to increase. So there is definite pressure on multifamily. So I think that seeing the uh, some some form of support financially speaking uh, both to tenants and a clear framework for landlords is is paramount especially in the next three months very helpful george thank you for that um last question i want to ask you and we can wrap up for today if you don't mind is you know you mentioned earlier this we've talked about this a lot sort of the migration the great migration that's happening do you see, so some people thought that this would be short-lived, right? Like, oh, you can live anywhere, and then some people would move, and then they're like, yeah, I don't know if I really want to move. Maybe maybe I'm bored now. I really want to go back to the office, right? A lot of companies, as we've talked about, like us at List Reports, right? We are 100% work from anywhere forever, right? So you can work from Timbuktu as long as you have an internet connection. Um, does this trend seem to be accelerating? Is it staying consistent? Is it slowing down? What does this migration look like? That's an excellent question, particularly for this year, because to your point, we all expected the remote work, at least to the extent we experienced it in 2020, to be temporary, right? Well, it's a blip on the radar. We're all going to go back to the office. Come, you know, it, it was supposed to be six months later from that's you know, right roughly. at the most. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and here we are, right? Almost, you know, coming up on a year. Yeah. And, and for most of us, that's still the, the, the status quo. So from my perspective, I do see the momentum slowing, uh, particularly as, as uh, a lot of, of companies are beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. However, I do see the remote work environment becoming a permanent feature of our employment landscape. Yeah. And why do I say that? Um, number one, because the business case for it has been already made and proven. 
right? So for, for the last at least roughly 10 years, whenever people started talking about remote work and at least one, twice a week, a lot of employers and, and managers were concerned about productivity, were concerned about the fact that employees might not necessarily be as productive. Well, I think that has, has been, you know, that concern has been addressed in, in spades this last year. One, two, uh, the, uh, with such steep costs in many urban areas, commuting, both in terms of time and dollars, was a major significant expense. With those savings, employees' well-being, their productivity has increased. So I see remote work at the very least becoming a retention and hiring uh, tool, right? If you can basically attract better employees by offering the ability to work remotely, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, absolutely. I see remote work also becoming a more permanent part of the landscape for a simple reason. Many of the people who have, for example, moved out of Manhattan into uh, New Jersey, Long Island, Southern Connecticut, or even in, you know, through New York State, or conversely, you look at the Bay Area, they moved to Sacramento, uh, Modesto, Fresno, somewhere farther away, uh, they bought homes. They're not likely all of a sudden going to just sell them, you know, come, you know, September of this year because their office is reopened. That's right. Uh, if anything, most of the migration has been within a one to two hour commute of major employment centers. Those have been the areas that benefited the most in 2020, along with other economies that are well diversified locally. Think here, Austin, think Dallas, Nashville. And so I think that's another reason why I see remote work continuing. And to sort of top it all off, think about the fact that tech companies, those are sort of the pioneers in this, in this migration away from their hubs, have only doubled down on this. Uh, look at Amazon, you know, latest announcement that they are going to create 3,000 new jobs in Boston, mm -hmm. right? This is on top of, of course, their second headquarter in Northern Virginia to uh, a, a significant operation in Nashville. I think this trend will continue, which will bring up a lot of these other... Uh, up to this point, uh, generally obscured markets, um, particularly for, for companies. So I see this as really being a continuing part of the landscape, not to the same extent maybe as in 2020, but very much uh, an important uh, component going forward. For real estate, I see that as a real positive. Yeah, well said, George. George, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You don't have to do this and you do it and you're giving back and you're sharing tremendous information. And I hope that everybody watching right now is just like a sponge right now and sucking all of this stuff in because it is just really important. George, thank you so much for your time and for being here today. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you. Randy, it's always a pleasure chatting with you and then appreciate uh, the invitation. Always, you know you are always welcome here and I think we're gonna have you back hopefully real soon, George. Thank you again. Absolutely. All right, agentpreneurs, there you have it. I hope you were paying attention. I hope you were taking notes because George is a wealth of knowledge and he brings, I think, a great perspective that we can all understand about what's happening. And look, this is complicated stuff. And it's complicated in the sense that it's multifaceted. There's this lever over here and this lever over here, right? But the more we listen to people like George, the more we study these things, the more informed we can be and the more we can honestly just be better at the work that we're trying to do, which is ultimately to serve all of our customers out there. So thank you for joining today. Appreciate you and your time. Until tomorrow, be safe, be healthy, be happy. We'll see you soon.